And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. John, The Dental Guy. And uh, we, this has been a great week of podcasting, but it's really been a tough week in some ways too, because we have had so much that has been happening and trying to keep up with all of it. And then we've got our own practices that we're thinking about. What do we do? 
And really, I've found that this uh, podcast world that we've kind of had here, Wes, has been a huge help for me in, in trying to come up with a game plan, make sure I'm doing the right yeah. things. And it's been amazing to see how our numbers have grown, you know, listeners have grown, kind of different audiences, as everybody right now is asking the same questions, Wes. And are you, are that's what we're going to be talking mind, about John? tonight. Were you What's reading that? my mind today? Because today... <laughs> I was talking to someone on the phone and they said, man, you know, you have, you know, done all these things. How have you done all those things to prepare mm-hmm. for reopening your office? And I said, you know, it's because of my podcast. I said, you right. know, one of the things that we remember that uh, Dr. Branamark said was to surround yourself, John, with people that are better than you, smarter yeah. than you. And guess what? You're bound to succeed. And that's yeah. what we're doing tonight is we're going to surround ourselves with someone that is just high level. And I'm super excited about this because does the science matter, right? Mm. And, and when we return to work, like what are you going to tell your team about the science, right? Right. About why and, we're and then the big thing, doing. and the big thing that uh, we really have had, I think we've learned over this last week as we've been doing a lot of podcasting is people are very interested in these questions. They want to know what does the science actually say? And you saw that in kind of our, um, our intro and our topic, and we're bringing somebody to you guys tonight who is very well versed in that science of what should we be doing? What do we know? What don't we know? So welcome, Dr. Robert Lemke. We're so glad to have you with us tonight on The Dental Guys. Well, thank you, and what an honor. I mean, I'm excited to be here. I, it's my privilege to be with you guys. I mean, quite honestly, that's where it all starts, you know, with the practice and the day-to-day and and seeing everything from from the little things to the challenging things. I mean, you guys are what, what brings it home. Well, let me just tell you a little bit about Dr. Lemke, John. Dr. Lemke, he's board certified oral surgeon. He was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas, and um, he's a graduate of Trinity University and the University of Texas Health Science Center. He holds dual degrees. He's both a doctor of dental surgery and a medical doctor, and uh, he completed his oral maxillary sur- surgery training uh, there um, at that Texas Health Sciences Center. He's also published, which we love that, and he's published more than 13 um, scientific abstracts on facial surgery and uh, contributed chapters to books and lecturing nationally and even preparing lectures as we speak. And, uh, you know, (laughs) one of the things that John was working on today was a teeth in a day procedure, and that's one of the things that Dr. Lemke loves and he loves to talk about. But, you know, more importantly, he has a balance, and I like balance in life. He has a family where he he does things outside the office. He enjoys cycling, running, and he also is a published photographer, John. So some of the same things that we like, uh, Robert Lemke likes. He sits on the board of the Academy of um, Osseointegration, and then also he's a past chairman of the AO research committee which we just love research and we've yeah. talked about in pre-production john talk about some of the things leading up to this and this discussion yeah i mean it sounds like dr lemke is a fellow nerd right and i mean that with all <laughs> the best intentions right because anybody that is really committed like we are to reading the journals and really dealing with the science is fits well with us and uh so we're going to take a little journey today through some of the science and what's led up to this discussion tonight has been the whirlwind of the last few weeks of guidance guidelines toolkits uh recommendations discussions osha cdc american dental association all the state dental associations uh all of these things have come together to get these questions in our minds about what do we do to go back to work as we return to work. And the biggest thing that we want to talk about today is where is the evidence? And and if there's one question we could sort of answer or try to answer tonight, it's how much of what we are doing to protect our patients, our team and ourselves is based upon evidence and science. How much of it is based upon fear? 
you know, how much of it is based on the unknown. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the unknown we shouldn't prepare for, but we want to dive into this. And I think the first thing we want to talk about is masks because everybody's been talking so much about masks and uh, OSHA has said <clears throat> that we are supposed to have NIOSH approved N95 masks for aerosol generating procedures. Um, tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that recommendation and a little bit about the science behind that recommendation. And, you know, there's other guidelines we've kind of been hearing about and let's kind of talk it through, you know, where is the science bringing us? How have we gotten to that point? What are your thoughts on that? Well, those are excellent questions and, and it's hard to even be, know where to begin to answer some of that because obviously, I mean, there's never been a pandemic like this in our society with what we now have current in regards to technology. And so trying to find a balance between, between what we know and what we have and what we don't know is, is really challenging. But what we know is that in general, we've always been used to wearing masks for the last, oh, 15, 25 years or so. And of course, there's levels of masks and they're surgical masks. But the bottom line is that all of those masks are there to protect us from, from either blood splatter or from us coughing onto a surgical field. If we're a surgeon or if we're a dentist and, you know, sneezing in someone's face, somehow those patients don't tend to come back. Um, and so now, though, when we have this, this invisible war against a virus, it's in a different area. It's in a different field where we need to think besides just a little droplet of blood or a coughing, we need to think about airborne issues. And that's where the N95 masks come in or KN95 masks because they form a better seal with the double elastics. So from a practical standpoint, those are protecting us from the environment as opposed to a surgical mask, which tends to protect more the environment from us. And so the recommendation originally was, well, you don't even need a mask. And then they said, well, wear masks if they have COVID. Well, we all know that there's a lot of asymptomatic sheds of the viral uh, disease. And so now, if you can get a mask, wear a mask. And then that's, of course, the challenge of getting a mask. So, mm. yeah. So that so that to answer that question, we have to dive deeper then into this discussion of, mm -hmm. you know, what before we talk about getting the mask, because I think that's another excellent thing to talk through and, and how to know that you have a real one and those types of things, but. What, you know, you mentioned, you know, how this has changed and kind of gone up and we, we, everybody I think knows about levels of masks now, even people that mm -hmm. didn't uh, six months ago are now very familiar with level three masks and level two masks and those ideas. But, you know, when we were given this toolkit by the American Dental Association, um, they talked and some guidance on mask types, they talked about a uh, surgical mask with a face shield. And I think the thing that we keep hearing coming up, one of our top kind of questions that keeps coming up is, is there science to indicate or show us that a surgical mask with a face shield is effective at preventing virus transmission? And how much more is an N95 effective in a clinical setting? Because there's, there's been some interesting studies, right? Let's talk about some of those studies. You know, what do we know? about surgical masks versus respirators when it comes to transmission of viruses? So excellent question. In regards to that one question of what we know about surgical masks versus N95 masks, Long and others just this last year uh, uh, in 2020 put out an article where he looked at retrospectively lots of studies that looked at, at uh, influenza, mostly influenza A, uh, historically, and the protection that either a surgical mask or an N95 mask gave to the individual, to the healthcare provider. And after analyzing all of this and then looking to see if that healthcare provider was lab, uh, by laboratory valid 
valid, uh, valid uh, verified to have influenza, they found that there was no difference between a surgical mask and an N95 mask. So at first mm. you say, oh, well, why even use a surgical mask? But if you dive even deeper, it may be that the surgical masks weren't used correctly or that the N95 masks weren't used correctly. So there's so many aspects and usually the weakest link is not necessarily the mask, but it's us. But I can tell you that we actually did some studies just even in our own office. Low filtration uh, of smoke through the mask. And when you wear a surgical mask, it just comes out completely in or out from the sides. And so from an airborne standpoint, that doesn't help. Now, studies regarding face shields show that for the most part, the splatter comes right down the center. And originally I would have thought, well, if you're right-handed and you're on the right side of the patient, you get more splatter on one side, but it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't uh, affected by left or right-handedness. It was really down the center, down around the eyes, around the nose and the mouth area. And so face masks were very important, but even in one study, they showed that there was some uh, penetration underneath and behind the face shield. So wearing a face shield alone is not sufficient. Wearing a surgical mask that's open is not sufficient. And so the recommendation is wear an N95 mask that seals and a face shield that protects from the splatter. You know, and I think the interesting thing here, this is one of the reasons why that a respiratory protection program is necessary. And that's what OSHA requires for team members that are going to wear a respirator now have to go through a respiratory protection, which is a simple thing to do. But then what's a part of that now is what we call a fit test, right? And a fit mm -hmm. test is one, an evaluation of the seal around your face. And for some individuals, you might have masks that don't fit correctly, that do have gaps. And then also, you actually don a hood with smells, like they crack smells, banana smells, and things like that. Yeah, smoke and things like that. Smoke and <clears throat> things like that, which could, which is an indication of good fit. Once you've mm -hmm. passed a fit test and even a medical exam to say that you can wear, right, a respirator, mm -hmm. then now you know the brand, the size, the shape of that respirator that's appropriate for you, the, the, the issue then, I think, I guess, is right now, if we have N95s and we're doing aerosol generating procedures, is that better than a level three? What does the science right. say? Yeah, do we, because the, the study you, you mentioned, um, they didn't find a difference in in contracting influenza, right? With those two different types of, mm -hmm. even though the, we know there is a better seal <clears throat> and we know that there is, uh, you know, obviously a, on the bench top, if you will, you know, a better performance of this respirator, it didn't seem to translate, at least in that study, into a protection difference. So mm -hmm. does that mean that it's overkill? Not that, Obviously, the guidelines tell us we have to do it, and and that's the end of it, really. But mm -hmm. when we're talking about the science, do you feel like we're going to see that roll back uh, because of this? Or I, obviously, we need more studies. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Are there studies out there that would say that an N95 is superior, um, not just on the bench top, but actually in a clinical setting? You know, do we have those studies? There's not a lot of studies out, and, and thanks, John. That is an excellent question uh, because it, it gets at the heart of is there a statistical difference if used, as Wes said, correctly. And I'm talking to mm -hmm. a dentist in Dallas, and uh, she was explaining that for a fit test, and it took multiple tries and resizing and getting a smaller size mask before they could find one that actually fit and it was not leaking. And she said, I can't remember if it was three or five different tries, or maybe it was even seven, but it was multiple tries. 
And she said, finally, when it did fit correctly, it was uncomfortable. Hmm. Hmm. We all go to the, you know, the stores and we see people with their masks, you know, below their nose, or I saw one with it on their nose, but their mouth is open. And, and someone said that they were at a store and, and someone pulled the mouth, uh, uh, the mask down, sneezed, and then put it back. And someone said, why did you do that? Oh, I didn't want to get my mask dirty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so <clears throat> still an error is, is ultimately where it's at. And right. hmm. so if we can have an N95 mask that is not counterfeit and that is fit tested hmm. and works, that is wonderful. If not, we have to try to do with what we have. But you mentioned the difference and there was a really good study by Fan and others in hmm. 2019. And this one just blew me away. It's awesome. And what they did is they, they took 59 healthcare workers. And they said, okay, you're treating influenza patients. That's great. You know, you're going to wear a, a gown, you're going to wear gloves, a face mask, and, and you're a doctor or you're a nurse. So you're going to have a stethoscope. Okay. So go out and treat them. And at the end of the day, come on back. So they did. And they swapped them doing the RT PCR test for the virus, the, the RNA of the virus, the influenza virus. And they swapped their gloves, they swapped their mask. They swapped their gowns and their stethoscopes. And then they said, okay, go ahead and doff, you know, remove the, the wear. And then they re-swapped them. They re-swapped their face. They swapped their hands. They swapped their uh, scrubs. And amazing, I mean, there was statistically essentially no difference. 31% of the gloves showed virus on it. And when they were removed and they tested the bare hand, 21% showed mm. virus. And then of the gowns, 21% was positive. And when they removed it and swabbed the scrubs, which, you know, they go home in sometimes or go to the grocery store and buy things on the way home, 11% showed the virus. Mm. And 12% of the face masks showed virus and 7% of the face had virus. So, I mean, mm. you all can figure out, wow. it, it's not that the face mask had a hole in it. I mean, what was going on? I mean, we all know. Right. So is it yeah. <clears throat> more important how we're uh, putting on and taking off our gear than it is what type of gear we have in, in some ways? I mean, does that maybe have, I mean, that study would seem to indicate I mean, we, if we don't have data right now that clearly says, right, that a 90, N95 versus a surgical mask, that there's a statistical difference, this study, though, seems to say that this is really maybe where we need to concentrate our, our effort to improve is right. how to safely put on and take off the gear. And you talked about this mm -hmm. in a previous AO webinar about you know mm. how to actually do this in fact there's even a video out there which we can go you can go back and look at on the aos feed where you go through how you guys are putting on taking off your gear but that's interesting to think that that really that may be where do you think that that's the area that we're missing the most i i think we need to start there because if we had all the fancy masks and all the fancy face shields it's worthless if we don't use it correctly. So we need to start mm -hmm. off, as we all know, with the basics. And you can even take a surgical mask and put a little piece of tape and <clears> probably <throat> get as good a, a, a fit with some tape along the sides and a face shield as you're going to get with an N95 mask that's not appropriately put on. Well, that's interesting. And, I, and I'll just say we had a question from one of our listeners who's watching this right now. Mm -hmm. um, that goes right to that, which is, you know, there's been, you I'm sure seen <clears throat> these neat, you know, you can use uh, Bellis 3D face scanning technology, 3D print a frame that better seals a level three mask. And based on what you're telling us now, it sounds like maybe that's, that could solve a lot of our problems with the mask. Um, has there been any I don't know if that's, is that so new that there's really not a lot of information out there? Cause there's, there's people asking, Hey, if I don't have N95s or KN95s, what do I do? 
Um, do you think that that's uh, essentially like a work practice control, if you will, uh, from a OSHA standpoint that maybe we yeah, could make engineering, a case for it? You're making your yeah. good faith best effort with what we have right now. You know, yeah. As, and, do you think that's reasonable, uh, or, or is, or are we just trying to push this uh, to get away from doing what OSHA says or something? No, I think it's absolutely reasonable, especially if you can't get a real mask, and and that's a whole nother category. I can tell you that you know it's one of those classic things. You look everywhere online, you can't find them. You call, you know, your big dental distributors, they can't get them for mm -hmm. two or three months, and so uh, you know, I had a friend in Austin who knew someone in Florida who is a pharmacist who, oh, they could get them for me. And, you know, it's already sounding bad, right? But, you know, you're desperate, right? We're all desperate. We want them. So, okay, yeah. I sent my my 500 bucks for my limited minimum order of 100 masks. <laughs> yes. And here they came yeah. back. And, and the outside of the box, okay, first of all, it looked like a little Kleenex box, okay, about this big, and it had 10 of them in. That's a bad start. It said Dollar Tree on the outside. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and I paid far more than a dollar, okay, for, for mass. And then I, we put them on, and it only had the ear loops. And, and you know, I, I just questioned it. So I, I, I was very critical, and I contacted the guy back, and, and I was kind of a little niffed. And he said, oh, no, see, they're stamped KN95. And he's like, oh, I guess they are. Well, then we did our own test, and and that's on our our Instagram, Advanced uh, Oral Surgery SA, where we actually had someone blow smoke through, and we had a 3M ventilator uh, respirator. Nothing came through, and they mm. put on that that other counterfeit one, which I didn't know at the time was counterfeit, and it was like a sieve. I mean, smoke mm. just came out everywhere, and and mm. I had given them some of them to some of my referrals. Mm -hmm. And now I felt bad because here I'm trying to help them. And yet I think I put them at more risk by giving them a false sense of security. Yep. And so mm -hmm. like you say, having a good level three surgical mask when we did the test was far better, especially if you tape it, than a, this worthless uh, counterfeit KN95 mask. You know, we had a good- we had a good conversation about just this uh, last week, uh, Dr. Lemke, and you talked a little bit about dentists and the fact that we um, are doing these donning and doffing procedures so many times during the day. And there's going to be a lot of innovation come out over the next even months to year regarding what we're talking about probably going to change really medicine uh, for the better. Um, but you talked about how dentistry could be the leaders in this, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think I'd like to hear your thoughts on that is, you know, how do we lead, right? And, and one, I don't want us to, um, I, I want you to speak to that just a little bit, and then I might follow up with a little commentary. Well, I mean, in general, dentists tend to be leaders anyway in the community we tend to be more vocal than medical doctors in general mm -hmm. but in this situation with covid we're kind of forced to be leaders and we we talked about there's a something that people can look up it's by the department of labor and they looked at a risk of covid based on on uh, essentially employment uh, what you did and the interesting thing was on the x-axis was the percentage uh, of risk that you would have of getting COVID essentially, zero to 100%. And on the y-axis, they looked at income, uh, low income versus high. And you can imagine, you know, if you're a CEO and you're sitting back in the office and just looking at numbers, well, your risk is very, very low, maybe four or 5%, and your income is high. If you're a web designer, well, you're not going to make as much as a CEO and you're in the middle, but their risk is still low because they're not interacting with anyone. If you looked at taxi cab drivers, well, the traditional ones, not, not the Ubers of the world, but they had the plastic sheets behind them. Their windows could be open. They're actually in the same four, five, six percent. But of course, we know who is on the other extreme. In fact, at 99.7%, 
risk of COVID was dental hygienists. And Wes, we were talking earlier about how so many dental hygienists are now listening in, which is so smart of them because they are the forefronts. They are the, you know, the, those are the Marines. <laughs> They're mm -hmm. in the, you know, front lines of the front lines. And so yeah. Yeah. the more dental hygienists that get on board and ask questions, the better. Second was dental assistants. So mm. they need to be listening to these talks. And they came in at about 93%. Third, what was up? Dentists at 92%. And medical mm. doctors, they fell farther down. But it was based on three different factors, uh, number of exposures, proximity, and the type of procedures that create aerosols. And, well, that's us. Mm -hmm. So we're forced to be a leader because if we're not, well, we're just going to get sick or we're going to have to fold our little arms and close our purposes. And we don't want to do either of those two. So each one of us, I mean, you guys are examples of, of leaders. I mean, you guys are spectacular. The AO has really pushed forward in education. And those are the types of people that, boy, I mean, I really admire you guys and them for, for setting examples, for setting standards, for asking questions. We may not have the answers, but asking mm -hmm. the questions and, yeah. and moving up in the right directions. Mm -hmm. Do you think if... It, so I, and I totally agree. I think we have so much opportunity here to, mm -hmm. um, to lead and, and it's been, it's been hard to watch in some ways because I feel like there's been, um, because of a lot of fear and because of conflicts of interest, because there are conflicts of interest. We know this, <clears throat> that people have in some ways, I think stress has brought out the worst in, in some. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I think that, that, that can lead to, uh, kind of separation in the community um, when really this is a chance for us to come together around the science and around the positive side of this of, hey, we have the ability here to innovate. We have the ability to learn together on uh, what works. Um, if if you come back to this question, you, you had mentioned earlier about the difficulty of getting PPE and getting masks specifically, which seems to be kind of the rate limiting step in this whole thing is, is the masks. We can get most of the other things. Um, what do you talk, what do you tell someone who has some masks and they're asking the question of how can I safely reuse the masks that I have? What are some ways um, that, uh, that are safe and proven that people, and, and is it safe? Is it proven? I think there's people still asking that question. It's a good question. And there's not a lot of answers out yet, but what I can say is that people try various things. I mean, the standard autoclaving of masks and for that matter, mm -hmm. gowns can be done. The problem with the gowns, just as a sideline is that the buttons tend to melt onto the fabric. And so mm -hmm. you have to be careful with that and insulate them. But if you do a certain few steps, then you can actually recycle or the gowns by sterilizing them. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, for masks, what I've started doing, and I've been doing literally for about, well, since day one uh, of this COVID, so about a month now, is we have a UV sterilization box uh, that mm -hmm. looks like a bread box. And I literally call it, Where's our bread box in, in our office? <laughs> and you open it up and it has mirrored surface on surfaces on the inside. It has a little grate that lifts it up. And then we put our masks in, in between every case and leave it for 20 minutes. And the UV light, UVC light sterilizes it and kills bacteria, fungal uh, aspects, fungi, um, and viricidal. And so that's one thing that we do. Um, another one that's a little off the cuff is microwaves. Now, the interesting thing about microwaves is way back when uh, you guys, uh, I don't know, you guys are younger than I am. You probably remember <laughs> the old VHS versus beta. Oh, yeah. That? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was oh, a yeah. war. Okay. That, was, that was a big deal. It was a classic one. That's right. That's right. It was a war, Wes. So it, yep. give us in, in a minute uh, or 20 seconds about the war. And I'll use that as a springboard. Yeah. So I remember my friends had Betamax. Okay. And 
and they were like, this is going to be it. You, and I remember, let me just say just one thing, Robert, you've asked the right person this question. I just want to let you know that. So proceed, and my, proceed. Wes. And my dad was an early adopter of like the VHS camcorder that like you had the, the shoulder harness carrying and you carried yeah, it out. It was like a to bazooka. Like the, fa the family <clears throat> picnic. And he's like, son, it's going to be VHS. I know it is. They're wrong. <laughs> and that's how passionate people got about this beta VHS thing. But we digressed a little bit for that nostalgia yeah. right that we love let's come back to the uv lights and the microwaves <laughs> well that's right so it was a competition between the two and and people were fervent about it and and you know one one out over the other well the same competition happened back in the 70s with microwave ovens and so two different frequencies i believe it was like 2450 and i can't remember the other one uh and one was uh, was put out by Raytheon and the other one by General Electric. And they were competing and they're very different wavelengths. So they did different things. Now, one was a big heavy unit and it would penetrate deeper. So you could put the whole turkey in. I know you're probably wondering, where are we going with this conversation, right? <laughs> anyway, you could put the whole turkey in and it would penetrate all the way and cook it. And it was great. But most people were cooking turkeys in the microwave. They were throwing in the pizza. So actually, uh, the, the company, and I can't remember which one was which, but the one that got, that had these shorter for a wavelength that just uh, penetrated only about an inch to two inches at the most, won out, and that's what we have. Mm. Well, there were studies though uh, that looked at using microwaves to kill because it is bactericidal and virucidal. In fact, there was a study back in the 1980s that looked at nasal hoods from, you know, na uh, nitrous oxygen mask. And mm -hmm. they actually mm -hmm. put it in the microwave and they modified the microwave a little bit and they coated it with virus and hepatitis and various viruses. And they found that after three minutes, well, actually one minute, significant numbers decreased, but after about three to four minutes, depending on the two different studies, all the virus was essentially dead. And so mm -hmm. I thought, wow, that's great. Now the FDA, FDA does not authorize or, or, uh, or state that microwaves should be used unless it's the other, the older microwave, which penetrates better. And so actually mm -hmm. that has been FDA authorized for milk and other food products because it can penetrate. Okay. But nonetheless, I thought, wow, this is great. You know, like you guys always trying to think a little crazy and a little uh, off the cuff. I thought we're going to take masks and put them in. And my mm -hmm. staffer's like, no, no, Dr. Lemke, you know, you can't put any metal. And I get a fork and I put it in and I show them you can use a fork, you know, and as long as there's no arcing, no problem. And they think I'm crazy, but, but you can do that. So I told my mom, my mom, <clears throat> well, she said to t say she's only above 80. Okay. So I can't use any more, but she's above <laughs> 80. And I gave her a pink mask and I, I told her, mom, you can, you can just throw it in the microwave. Well, <clears throat> mom did that. I actually have the mask here. Uh, awesome. I don't know if you can see the mask. <laughs> oh. oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah, it started on sorry, fire. <laughs> <laughs> Did so, you buy your so mom a new microwave? Headline, you know, <laughs> son kills mother by fire in microwave. <laughs> but, you know, sterilizing uh, face mask almost so came good. out. But mom got a spatula and hit it a few times. Anyway, what I kind of left out was that, that this and the cotton heated up and it caused a fire. So yes. other than that, it actually works well if you remove the metal. Anyway, so that's mm. kind of a little far-fetched, but, but there are various techniques. UVC light can do it. There's also different um, hydrogen peroxide gases that are being studied. The yeah. old classic ethylene uh, uh, dioxide gas mm. uh, can be used, and some hospitals have that. So all of those are techniques. Uh, I would not recommend, I don't want anyone's mother uh, dying from fires mm. in their kitchen, so so don't, right. don't recommend that. Now, if it's all cloth, it probably will work, but but it didn't come from me. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I know there's after, even been too the technique of just leaving the masks out after they've been used. So you can, you can hang the mask or put it in a paper bag and leave it for three days 
and the virus can only live for a certain amount of time. And so if you have enough, I guess you could, you could, you know, that's kind of what we've been doing with some of ours that are limited is, you know, putting them in a bag and this is the Monday mask and you don't touch that mask again until, you know, next Monday. Uh, and I think there's hospitals that have been doing that uh, as well. Obviously not nearly as, as good. We've got a UV light box coming. I'm interested to see, you know, how quick that, how, how, uh, let me ask you about that. How quick is that? Do you know how long is that cycle? 20 minutes. And the studies uh, confirm okay. that. So 20 minutes okay. in that light box uh, with a UV is adequate for virucidal effects. Uh, we've taken that a step further. We ended up getting the UV light, a large, just the light. And it's about, I think, 60 watts. And I thought, ah, eh, 60 watts is nothing. But oh my gosh, I mean, it almost blinds you. And we actually, between each patient, that's one of the things we do. And we can talk about that later, you know, the different steps. But we actually put that light in every room so that we don't have to hmm. wait three to four hours we have a 30 minute cycle of turning over rooms. And actually the studies show really 20 minutes is all that's necessary, but we do an extra 50% just to be on the safe side. Hmm. Interesting. That's Interesting. So technique. yeah, let's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, and that's yeah. that let's talk about some of the other things you're doing in your practice. I'm interested to hear, you know, just some of the things that you've implemented uh, some of which might be things we all, already kind of know about, but if there are other things that are maybe things that you, you, you've either discovered or you've kind of put in place as kind of a, you know, an extra precaution, uh, walk us through a little bit of that. Sure. So we divided it into four sections. Okay. Uh, the first is the pre-patient. The second is just immediately prior to surgery. The third is actually surgical aspects. And the fourth is actually after surgery, which is also important. And we tend to forget about in general. So pre-surgical, we try to decrease our exposure with patients. So where possible, we're doing teledentistry. Now, I'll be honest, in the state of Texas, the Texas State Board of Dental Examiners clearly states teledentistry is not allowed. So we're just doing screenings, okay? Uh, and mm -hmm. it gives me an opportunity to spend time with a patient. I mean, we all enter dentistry because we enjoy being with people. And you guys are probably the kind that sit and you, you get to know your patient before you even start or look in their mouth. And, mm -hmm. and that's most of dentists. And so this gives me that opportunity to do that, but in a safe environment in my office enclosed. And so we do video conferencing. That's the first thing that we'll do. Uh, second is when the patient comes, we actually have them call us from outside. We send a staff member with a mask on, takes their temperature. Now, temperature is a whole nother issue if we want to talk about that and the inconsistency of temperatures and infrared versus uh, digital. And we can, that's a whole nother conversation. But we take their temperature. Okay. And then we only allow that patient to come in. You know, family members and aunts and uncles and whatnot, they have to wait outside or, uh, or out, out in a car. Okay. So that one person comes in at a time they have to put on a mask outside. Now, nowadays, most people have their own masks, so they wear their mask in. Uh, we go through the screening questions, and those are real important because we don't limit them to the old classic questions, which were, have you traveled? Well, nowadays, no one's traveling, right? So that's almost a, a ridiculous question, but, but still, have you traveled? But then we go into the actual, have you had a cough? Do you have a fever? But more important are the symptoms that are associated with COVID. And mm, that's mm -hmm. everything from uh, the cough aspects and the temperature, as we mentioned, but also uh, the diarrhea, loss of smell or taste. All of those are important to ask. So we go through all of those even before someone comes in. And then if they can make it that far, and we know that, asymptomatic people can still be carriers. Then we go into this surgical room. Okay. Well, we're already gowned. We don't put our gown on in front and mm -hmm. we actually have the patients use a mouthwash. 
And I'd say most general dentists probably have their patients use a mouthwash. But there was a study that looked at, at not COVID-19, but SARS and MERS, which were other variations of the coronavirus. Mm-hmm. And they looked at the, the ability to kill it with alcohol and hydrogen peroxide and you know all these different things and, and chlorhexidine. And chlorhexidine did work, but there was one small hmm. catch. It takes 10 minutes. <laughs> no. so, okay. <laughs> so, so just imagine your staff saying, only seven more minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you got the Exactly. Oh, no, no, you're, you're losing it. You know, it, it, it just oh, can't work. Oh, man. But, yeah. So, so, so it's a good idea, but it's just not going to work. Well, hydrogen peroxide actually within one minute kills. Mm. So I, I told my, my son this at dinner, and he's a college student, and he laughed and he said, so you're going to offer free whitening too, right, Dad? There you go. <laughs> now, why did the ADA take that out of the, the toolkit? You know, they, they were saying that early on, you know, when before we were kind of shut down, they yep. said, hey, you should do this. Um, and now with the new toolkit, they indi- seem to indicate that their studies don't support that. Is that. Has something changed? Because it seems strange to us. It it seems strange to me too. So Hmm. quite honestly, you know, you guys hit, especially you, John, you mentioned uh, that there's so many factors and Wes, we were talking about it. You know, there's political, there's economic, there's (laughs) social, Hmm. there's geographic, uh, so many religious too. And -hmm. and we don't want to get into politics, sex and religion, but I hate to say it, you almost kind of have to because it affects us indirectly mm. and directly in our practices uh, right. with this mm. pandemic. And, yeah. and so with that, I mean, when the, the World Health Organization and when the CDC were saying, oh, you don't need masks, it wasn't really based on science, but availability and, and not wanting everyone to run out and buy masks so that the healthcare providers couldn't use it. So it was other factors than science I mean, is, right. is mm. practicality. And, and so hydrogen peroxide, that's what we're doing. I mean, we're doing a minute yeah. of chlorhexidine mix 50-50 with hydrogen peroxide. Now, is it mm-hmm. going to kill everything? No, of course. It's in their lungs. It's in their nasal uh, respiratory system. Uh, it's not. But you know that we'll never get rid of it 100%. Mm-hmm. So if you think of everything as a bell curve, Mm-hmm. Where do we want to be? Well, we want to push ourselves to be in the area of, of maximum safety. We'll never get to 100% safe, but what can we do to get there? So we do the mouth rinse. We also get just a four by four gauze. Now, okay, my patients are sedated, okay, but we lay mm-hmm. it across their nose so that nothing from their nose is breathing out, especially if they sneezed, okay, and we're right in front. Okay. Again, we're, my patient is sedated. So I use a mouth, uh, uh, essentially a, a gauze in the back as a throat, uh, to help prevent from any aspiration of materials, but also to prevent large droplets from me. Now what general dentists can do are all those other systems, the isolates and the, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know, I mean, you guys, you probably know mm-hmm. all the different systems better than I do. Sure. Yeah. So, so that can decrease. So what are some of the other systems? Yeah, there's a uh, product called Isovac from, um, and Isolite is the same yeah, thing. Isolite. Isolite. Dry from Xyrus. Mr. Thirst, Mr. Thirsty from, from Zerk. Zerk. Um, there's, there's a, a new one that came out. Yeah, there's a new one that came out that's called uh, Relief, which is uh, mm-hmm. for people that can't tolerate something that goes all the way across the back of the mouth, of course, for the non-sedated patients. Um, mm-hmm. It sits in the cheek, in the vestibule, and it's connected to high volume suction. There were a couple of those that were out before that were saliva ejector uh, compatible. That's but this is the first that one that's, that. yeah, that's compatible with high volume suction. And there's there's a number of other, you know, dry shield. I mean, there's a ton of them that have kind of the same idea. Um, and I think you're right. You know, having something that could actually cover across the mouth is probably Old ideal. rubber dam. Right. And then there's yeah. rubber dam isolation. Yeah. I mean, we've kind of, I've, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we don't want to forget about that too quick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Exactly. So you've right. got the so, patient now. You know, here's the thing that what you've done. 
right, is again, this bell curve you talk about, I think we forget about this all so often, is that you are now with all the questioning, with the temperature taking, with the the procedure of, you know, walking the patient back, having them rinse and wash their hands or use some type of uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizer, and then you get them in the operatory and you you are rinsing with a hydrogen peroxide-based solution and you're setting them in the chair. You're not touching the patient's hands. You're not doing anything other than just getting the patient back and you've screened them at this point. You've taken all those precautions. You talk about shifting a bell curve it really mm-hmm. starts to el- to eliminate some of the chances of spreading this to yourself, to your right. team, to, to other people, to, to where it becomes almost a minuscule um, chance that you might get this. Is that what the science mm. is saying, and that's what we're trying to do during this medication phase? That's it. It's just risk management. And there's so many steps, you know, generally four or five steps to risk management, identifying the risk, uh, following through, establishing a protocol, monitoring to Mm. see if that's working, and then starting all over. And so it's risk management to decrease our risk. We'll never remove it. I mean, we know as dentists, I mean, we went into the field knowing that there's always a risk. Mm -hmm. It's a little (laughs) higher now, but we're trying to get it back to what we're comfortable with. And everyone's going to be a little different regarding comfort. Now, the hydrogen peroxide, I think we have to be a little careful. Again, I'm going to be using it, but we have to be careful that it's not in there too long or that it's too, you know, that that it's all 100%. And I say that because Mm -hmm. I remember, uh, I'll tell a little story. Uh, Years ago, an elderly lady fell on the ground and she cut up her whole scalp. And I spent probably about two or three hours stitching and putting everything back together. And, oh, I was so proud. I was, you know, patting myself on the back. And, yes, so so excited for her. Well, she lived out of town. And she came back about three or four weeks afterwards for some suture removal. Well, it's a little late, but better late than never. And I looked at her and I saw a skull. Mm. I mean, literally just her bone exposed Mm. right there. And, and it's one of those cases where, how do you try to be professional and not let your jaw drop? Okay. Mm. And, and go, <laughs> right. oh my, <laughs> you know, that happens every <clears> now and then, but you try to be professional. And, and I said, what happened? And she said, what do you mean? Well, well it was all healed or, or put together. I mean, words were losing me, right? When I'm looking at her <laughs> skull exposed, I mean, like, you know, and she said, well, I cleaned it every day, two or three times a day. Well, what with? hydrogen peroxide and so ah. hydrogen peroxide well, is great because it kills but it's bad because it kills it yeah kills. so yeah. <laughs> so we have to be a little careful and that story really drove that home and i tell patients don't yeah. use hydrogen peroxide so you know so i'm kind of now, going back to my yeah, word in, a little it's limited yeah So in an oral surgery practice or a surgically based practice, you know, just to pivot, because we have a lot of AO listeners that are surgeons, as opposed to more our listeners are more general dentistry. We've had a lot of surgeons talking about um, what they've been thinking about with suction. Uh, Typically in an oral surgery office or most that I've been around, um, you've got a relatively small uh, lumen to your, that's, I, I pull, I use the word lumen in a podcast, uh, a small lumen, a small opening in your suction, right? Because you want to be able to be pinpoint accurate with that suction and not have this giant suction. So that's good when you're talking about blood. But when we start to talk about aerosols, when we start to talk about taking out third molars or, or, you know, implant surgery, bone reduction, and we're seeing aerosolization, um, what do you think people should do about that, especially in an office that doesn't have the general dentist, we kind of have an advantage there because we tend to have these big suctions in general. So what do you, what do you tell a surgeon about that? What do you think they should look at as far as some of the technology that's out there to help to reduce the aerosols that are, that are in the operatory? Excellent. So, so I approach that twofold. One is the practical And then the other, we'll talk a little bit about some of the newer technologies. The practical is that we just need to uh, modify a little bit what we do, limit or don't use ultrasonics. Where 
uh, obviously a good mask with a good uh, uh, a shield or fit on it, and then wear a shield. Now, for people who have not worn shields, I'll be honest, and I traditionally have not worn a shield. I've worn glasses with little, uh, just glasses. And it's very difficult to listen to someone when you have a shield on and they have a shield and you're talking and it's reverberating back and forth in your shield and it bounces to the back eventually and then it comes back and then they can't hear you because they've got a shield that goes maybe partially over their ears and it sounds like we're underwater. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we're going to have to come up uh, with a, a dental special ops tactical uh, system <laughs> where we have a hand signals, you know, that, that goes like, you know, something <laughs> like, you know, perfect. Kind of like, you know, special ops. Now I say that kiddingly, uh, but, but seriously, it's difficult to wear all this and, and yep. practice. So it's a balance, but wearing a face shield, wearing the mask, limiting what fluids, uh, irrigations, maybe modifying the lumen, maybe going back to a little bit larger lumen size may be important. And then also afterwards, making sure that we scrub the rooms, we either use UV light and some of the newer technologies that are really being advertised now and, and may or may not work is hydrogen peroxide uh, vapors that lay mm -hmm. out and, and <clears throat> go into the room. Uh, UV, UV light can be used in a uh, ventilation system. There's one, for example, Vita Shield, and it's kind of an interesting concept. What they do is they take the panels in the uh, those drop down ceilings, and they literally just took a fluorescent bulb and they put a fan on either side. I mean, on one side, the fan pulls light through. They have a UV light, and then it comes back and it comes out the other side, and so it hmm. circulates the air. Now, are there a lot of studies? Not a lot, but there are one or two, and I'm impressed that they actually have one or two because I've looked at other systems, including some of these hydrogen peroxide systems, and I cannot find many studies. And one mm -hmm. company said, oh, yes, we have a study, and they showed me the study. And at the bottom, it said, for internal use only. And it went on <laughs> yeah. with a few other disclaimers. And it's like, okay, well, I'm not sure I buy that. And again, we all want to practice based on yeah. evidence. I mean, we don't want to just waste our money because these systems are not cheap. They, they can yeah, add up. But, exactly. but yeah, wearing the shield, wearing the mask, uh, scrubbing down the room, using a UV light uh, if possible. And, you know, we're having to start to look at other systems and other concepts too. There's There's been this back and forth about what we do and and who really tells us what to do. And in dentistry, we um, have lamented a little bit, John and I, that we as dentists haven't done a better job at setting a standard for ourselves. And I, I, I'm not looking for someone to walk in my office. I'm not asking for someone to walk in my office and tell me what to do. I'm not asking for that. But one, I think we need to be leaders, press for research into these areas so that we know what's necessary, right? Necessary mm -hmm. to mitigate um, our risk and, and help our patients achieve the best that's possible in our office. And that's why we like yeah. the AO, you know, but John, right. where and what, and where do we get our information? Right? Yeah. Because we've had this discussion over the last couple of weeks about who writes and who controls what you do. And I know you've had right. some interesting things that have happened, uh, Robert Lemke, in, in Texas, as we have in Tennessee. John, you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, as we're, <clears throat> as a perfect, I think, segue, as you said, you know, you're looking at the bottom of the advertisement and it says for internal use only, you know, and, yeah. and that, that is, that's why we love, you know, working with organizations like AO and, and we'll, I mean, obviously this is an AO podcast, but we're, we're members of the AO long before we were partners with the AO and you know the the whole idea of organizations that are evidence based because it's not good enough to say internal study you know on file data on file or something like that you know we need to demand as practitioners as doctors 
um, as hygienists. I mean, as everyone in this field, a high standard of evidence, and that's what AO is all about. Um, and I think that uh, you know Texas has been interesting because we watched how things evolved in Texas because Tennessee was kind of right behind Texas, and we were looking at Texas, and some interesting things happened where recommendations changed or requirements changed almost uh, on an hourly basis there for a couple of days, right? I mean, it was it was like a it was the wild west of Texas there for a minute. And I mean, it, what what's happening with this and how does this bring us back as we kind of conclude tonight? Um, how does this bring us back to where do we go mm. for the evidence? You know, kind of talk about maybe as we close what happened in Texas you know, what, what do you think is going on as we're juggling all this information? And then, you know, kind of tell people, where do you feel like they should be going to look for the best evidence, the best science? How can they plug into that? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is, yes, uh, uh, such an important part uh, of having good leaders. And, and that has to happen on so many levels. <laughs> and, and some of it may even step on people's toes because politics is involved. And unfortunately, though, it's a lot of the politicians that make rules that govern how we practice. OK, I'd like to think otherwise, but that's not necessarily the case. So in Texas, you know, if we look at everything, really, the only person that can take away someone's license is your state board. Mm -hmm. The ADA is a wonderful organization, but they don't have any 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 weight they don't have a, a hammer to, to enact laws other than mm -hmm. than representing us now i think as dentists we've really fallen into a bad trap and part of it is and i don't want to say corporate dentistry but what happens is a lot of dentists coming out of dental school have joined corporate dentist dentistry and that's fine but there's no time or incentive for them to join organizations like the ADA or their state organization. And why? Well, because it takes away from production, obviously. And so in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, it's all about the bottom line, the numbers, the economics. And so the voice uh, of these, all these new dentists that are coming out is not being heard. And so mm. they can't, they can't have a voice on a political level, a federal level, or even a state level. So that's sad. And I think you guys are, are, are hit the nail on the head. I mean, people just need to get more active in their states and their state agencies and their state organizations mm -hmm. uh, and the ADA and then the Academy of Austin Integration. I mean, I've fallen in love with, with how it's run, the people behind it, because it's evidence-based and it's, it's mm -hmm. not about, well, in my hands or, you know, let me show you a case that looks good. And, and that's yeah. really so important because that allows us to practice our best. And that's what we want to do at the yes. end of the day. We want to be our best. So in Texas, you know, I was giving a talk uh, to another city and, uh, and it was really funny because in Texas, the governor who does have, the ab ability to create executive orders. Okay. So the governor put out an executive order and, and the executive order read that dentists essentially should not be practicing or healthcare professionals or dentists should not be practicing unless there was active bleeding where they were going to die or an airway issue. <laughs> and okay. Right. Well, that, that limits <laughs> it a lot. It's pretty strong. Pretty strong. But, yeah. Very strong. I mean, no, no questions. Okay. This very next line said, but this does not apply if you don't use up PPE for a hospital or have a patient that might enter a hospital and take up a bed, essentially. Now, the ADA and the TDA left out that second line <laughs> and just said, ah. don't practice. Mm. And, and mm. that's what was advertised. Well, later... There were two more executive orders. And by the third, one extra line was added that if you had a state approved hospital facility, then you could also practice. So what did happen was that was the governor's, the executive orders. The Texas State Board then wrote their own orders and said, well, according to the governor, 
all dentists are not state approved facilities and so cannot practice. Oh my. But that's not what the governor said. Mm. And I was going to point that out. Uh, and my wife, I, I told her this, I said, the state, the state board is completely wrong. And she said, no, it's not Robert. And I pointed it out to her and, and she's a very bright person. And she edits, she does copy editing for a lot of journals and articles in dentistry. And she looked at it and said, okay, well, you're right, but I wouldn't say it. It's like, no, I'm going to say it. And she walked out like most of our wives do, shaking her head, you do what you want. Well, three hours <laughs> later, like I said, I mean, it changes by the hour. There was an amendment <laughs> by the Texas State Board that said, oh, well, uh, now we're not following the executive order. We're going to follow the CDC guidelines, which says only bleeding or airway compromise. My well, the goodness. funny thing is, I thought, okay, well, let me look at the C CDC guidelines. So I looked at the CDC guidelines, and they said, our guidelines are based on the ADA guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just, it's kind of crazy. I mean, there's so much of this, mm. you know, the, the, the tail wagging the dog sometimes, and the dog wagging the tail sometimes, and you got, you know, all these organizations, and really, as we've talked about, and we don't want to go too far down this rabbit trail, but you know, no, it's really about liability. You know, no one yes, wants to accept liability <clears throat> for making a decision that could affect someone else's life, even though that is what their very job is, <laughs> is to make decisions so that we can. We talk so much about leadership in this podcast and, yeah. and we need that. We've called for that multiple times on our podcast is just good leadership and discussion amongst these organizations. We just had it happen in our state. And again, I won't go into this too far, but the other day we were told we could go back. The governor said we could go back. Everything was going great. We went back the day we went back midday, Tennessee OSHA drops this bomb on us saying postpone elective procedures within <laughs> Hours after that, they TDA Tennessee Dental Association sends an email out saying, basically, just kidding. You know, the Tennessee OSHA released the wrong guidelines. They're actually revising that, and that will be re released to follow the governor's order. So, you know, I mean, in a matter of hours, you can go from things are going to be great to things are we're, we're never going to go back to we're back. And I think that this just goes back to, again, all that we've been talking about this evening. Best practice. We have John. to first look at the evidence and develop best practices. That doesn't yep. mean, as Robert, you said, we can reduce everything to zero, no. but it means that we have to use evidence-based common sense and evidence-based practices, um, and we need to seek out the groups that are. Um, I, I think this has been an amazing discussion. I think that you know there's a lot more to this, obviously, and I think what I would refer people back to, if you wanna hear more from Dr. Lemke, I mean, just recently, you did a couple of webinars for AO. If you're an mm -hmm. AO member, you have access to those, uh, I believe, no, at no charge. If uh, you're not an AO member, go check that out and, and see if you can get connected to those because this goes even much deeper into the virus itself you talked about, you know, what, mm -hmm. what telling us more about the virus, some of the epidemiology, and then the actual the pathogenesis of the disease. Very good stuff. And then a lot on PPE. Um, so I think, you know, go back and, 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 and get more. And, and you mentioned your Instagram too. You guys are actually putting stuff on your Instagram, your office Instagram on some of the testing and PPE you're doing. That is very cool. I, I, are you, who's in, I, I just got to ask, was that, in charge that you of doing your social that? media? Do you have somebody like, do you have, yeah, do you have somebody <laughs> putting that up there for you? I, I have two staff members who do that and, you know, they love uh, doing it and they're good at it. And so uh, I give them a few ideas. I, uh, you know, I'll say, hey, why don't we do one on this? And they run with it. So, you know, you mentioned earlier, surround yourself with great people. And, and mm. we are only as good as our staff. I mean, we all know that. I mean, uh, sure. patients will come back to us. We'd like to think it's because of us, but we know mm. the truth is that it's a team. And without having the team and having good support from our uh, taking care of our, our administrative and our assistants and our nurses in our offices. Uh, and, and if we don't take care of them, they can't take care of, take care of us. And, right. and together, that's where yeah. it really works. And, and yeah, you and guys, I mean, feel, you guys and, yeah, and if they feel like all the things you're doing in yeah. your office, I mean, isn't it amazing the response that you get from your team? You know, my team, even though it's some of level. them were a little nervous, 
when you engage together and you discuss what's going on and you dive into the evidence together and you show them what you're doing. I mean, we're <laughs> frankly, we're spending a lot of money. We're spending a lot of time. Um, and, and, and I'm not, I mean, some of that's very stressful, but on the other hand, <laughs> if you share that with them and you go through with them, what you're doing and you kind of show, Hey, we are trying to develop best practices together as a team. Um, man, they, they have just, I mean, I am humbled by the things that my team has said to me, um, about this because obviously not everybody is, um, some people have the approach of just do the minimum. And, uh, you know, I think that in the long run, the reason why some of our practices may come out of this stronger is because we're able to, you know, show our team, lead our team through this, hopefully showing that we care about best, the best things we got. And obviously you're doing that. Um, Wes, go ahead and close this out, man. This has been an amazing discussion. Yeah, you know, I, I really have enjoyed getting to know uh, Robert Lemke and, um, yeah. Over the past week, we've spoken several times on the phone, and uh, John, I can tell you enjoyed it tonight. I kind of let you roll a little bit because Robert and I rolled for probably 30 or 40 minutes the other day, and it was a great conversation. <laughs> and um, I tell you what, I'd like for Robert to tell us a little bit about uh, what he's up to now and what's mm -hmm. his next big thing with the Academy um, plug some of your stuff because we want yeah. to know, uh, what you're doing next. And, and I, I'm just going to go ahead and say it right now, John, we want to have Robert back on our show and oh, we yeah. want to talk, we want to talk, I want to talk some, some stuff, right. And we'll not, we'll yeah. kind of in the post show here, we're going to geek keep, out. We're going to, we're going to geek out. out just a little bit on another show, but in the post show, let's talk about our next time that we can get on. Robert, where can people find you? How can they reach out to you? And what's your next big thing with the Academy of Osseo Integration? Well, they can reach out to me through the Academy of Osseo Integration. They just contact them and, and they can contact me. Of course, obviously, they are always welcome to email me directly. And uh, we can give them that email on your websites or on your uh, later. We can include that so that they can look up, uh, look that up. You know, the, the latest thing, and we were chatting about this, Wes, just earlier, is that the Academy is just a wonderful group. And, and John, you mentioned, and you, you both mentioned that surround yourself again with great people. When I was honored to be on the board, I, I sat down and with other, some new people and everyone goes around the room and introduces themselves. And, you know, there's a dean of the dental school and, and there's, you know, the chairman of the program in Harvard and UCLA and Penn, and they just go around the room and, and it's like, wow, oh my gosh, wow. And then they get to me and it's like, oh, I'm an oral surgeon, you know? So I'm just humbled to be around them. But I think that's what's inspiring to me is that being a part of this association every day, you can just literally contact them and they are happy to spend time with you to help you out. I mean, their heart, their soul is all into taking care of the members. You know, we were going to have a, a meeting in Seattle and we had to cancel. We were one of the first large company or corporate uh, organizations in the United States to cancel. But we did that right. because they wanted to take care of the members. Now, in the future, we're looking at uh, more of online blogging uh, where uh, people will be able to interact uh, with each other. And that's actually what uh, what i am now been tasked to put together. So I literally, I was working on a little of that last night uh, with uh, our president, uh, Dr. Clark Stanford and uh, be working with some more and I'm looking forward to doing that and bringing in new students. We have, uh, we have scholarships for students for the next year's meeting. Hopefully we'll all get to go uh, where we have travel grants that help support the students. And that's where it's exciting to hear these people and their, their students are also people who are older who just came up with a research project and are presenting it. And that's what's so fun because it makes me think outside the box. And, and that's where the honor is, is to be with all of them. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Thank you. I think this, this has been, this has been, been fantastic. You know, yeah, it has. It's been great to talk through this. <clears throat>
Well, listen, if you're listening to this and this is your first time hearing uh, the Dental Guys, uh, first of all, we want to thank you so much for listening to this live stream podcast. We have been working with the Academy over the past, say, six months to produce several of these that we'll be letting out over the next year or so. And we're super humbled to even be asked to do that. So um, I need you to go give the Academy of Osseo Integration some love. And how you do that right now is if you aren't following them on um, YouTube, you need to subscribe to their YouTube channel. Another way that you can support the AO is to go subscribe or like and follow their Facebook page. They're all the time. Listen, they have been one of the most active organizations when it comes to putting out just good quality content and Robert Lemke is part of that content that you're seeing streamed out through webinars and how to's, how to get back to work. What does the science say? I mean, he has a video out there of how to walk into your office, don and off your PPE. And I thank the AO for, for allowing us to bring Robert on to talk a, a little bit about some of the science and what it says. If you're a Dental Guys listener, Hey, listen, we want to continue to bring you content, and how we do that is for you to share it with a friend, uh, with another colleague. I really appreciate all those that have joined us over the last few weeks. This has been fantastic. We appreciate you more than you can know. Uh, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast um, or every podcatcher that you have, and I really appreciate, um, again, the AO for doing this. So for Robert, for John, I'm Wes. And this has been another great episode, and we are the Dental Guys.